The last video introduced the Internet on a very high level of abstraction. It showed what it is and what services it provides. This video is about how a network can be built in general. That means on which fundamental principles networks can be based on. In particular, we will again look at the principles underlying the Internet. Furthermore, I would like to show you how the networks that make up the Internet are interconnected. One of the central questions a network needs to address is how the available resources are shared, in particular how bandwidth is shared. As with all shared resources, there is a contention when the demand is larger than the supply. In the following, we will distinguish two ways how network resources can be shared. The first approach to resource sharing requires to reserve those resources before the actual data exchange that requires end systems to reserve those resources along the path and only afterwards, when all reservations have been successful, they can start to send data to each other. This principle is depicted in the figure in the lower right corner. The path in orange in that figure depicts that someone has successfully reserved one third of the bandwidth between the shown routers. This form of resource sharing has one critical advantage. By exclusively reserving a resource, a certain quality of service can be guaranteed. The reserved bandwidth in this case is always available to the sending end system. The old telephone system was working this way. It had the advantage that once a call went through, it would work for the whole duration of the call as the bandwidth to transmit the voice signal was reserved until the call was terminated by hanging up, which in turn made the previously reserved resources available again. This method of resource sharing worked well for the phone network because the bandwidth required to carry voice is known and fairly constant. In general, this kind of resource sharing works well when the traffic pattern is fairly constant and the demand is known. That means when the peak and average demand are not far apart. Resource reservations, however, also have certain drawbacks. For example, when reserved resources are not used, they cannot be just given to other users. That means they remain unused. When all resources are used up through reservations, new users cannot be admitted until resources are released again. Networks that permit resource reservations are called circuit switch networks because they establish something that acts like a dedicated circuit between the two nodes in the network with a given bandwidth. So before actually transmitting data, given a network that allows resource reservation, a circuit has to be established and that takes some time and can potentially fail if some component along the path cannot permit a reservation. Furthermore, the circuit has to be torn down at the end in order to make the reserved resources available again. These operations have to work reliably so that the network as a whole functions well. For routers, this has another important consequence. Every router has to maintain state for every active connection that runs through it. That means it has to store information about every ongoing connection between two devices. With telephony, this seems to be a reasonable requirement because a phone has only a single active connection at any time and most of the time the phone is inactive. An internet-capable device is active over a much longer time frame and could maintain hundreds or thousands of active connections at any given time to different destinations on the internet. A modern website often triggers the browser to open many different connections to different servers on the internet to fetch the website's HTML file, JavaScript files, CSS files, ads and other content that is required to display the site. Also, before fetching those objects, it is not known to the browser how much bandwidth it would sensibly need to get those objects within a reasonable amount of time. Think for yourself, how much bandwidth would you reserve in order to download your emails, for example? What would be a sensible amount? And why would a network operator trust our judgment and reserve that much bandwidth for us? It appears circuit switching is not a good basis to build the Internet upon. Before looking at how the Internet is implementing resource sharing, let us look at two exemplary ways to split bandwidth into reservable chunks. One way to divide bandwidth is to exclusively assign 
non-overlapping frequencies to different connections so that they do not interfere with each other when these frequencies are used simultaneously. This approach is called frequency division multiple access. Another approach does not separate the frequencies used, but the time in which the full bandwidth is used. Time is divided into frames, which in turn are divided into slots. Every connection is given a specific slot per frame, during which that connection can use the full bandwidth. In the example shown here, for both approaches, one connection will receive one-fourth of the full bandwidth. The Internet does not rely on resource reservations as seen before. Packets are sent using the full available bandwidth and resources along the path are used on demand. Clearly, that means that there cannot be any guarantee regarding the quality of service. Even worse, on the Internet there can be overload situations, also known as congestion. Take the figure as an example. There are two end systems connected via 10 megabit per second links to the router. The router is connected via a 2 megabit per second link to the next router. The path all packets take is through the 2 megabit per second link and all packets need to share the bandwidth of this link. It is easy to see that when both end systems send at 10 megabits per second, which they can because their access link provides that bandwidth, the bottleneck link in the middle will be overloaded. At full rate, both end systems would send packets to the router at 20 megabits per second in sum, which could only forward packets at one tenth of that rate of the bottleneck link. Another property of these kind of networks is that they follow the store and forward paradigm, which means that packets have to be received completely before they can be forwarded onto the next link. Networks like that are called packet switch networks and the Internet is the most prominent example of one. Packet switch networks work well when traffic patterns are irregular such as the ones that are common on the Internet. The reason is that packets are not bound to previously reserved resources. They use available resources on demand and packets of different end systems use these resources as they arrive. Given that these end systems send packets in seemingly random and irregular bursts and patterns, the packets use the available resources efficiently in a process which is called statistical multiplexing. As we have seen, the Internet is a packet switch network for good reasons. To illustrate again why packet switching works so well compared to circuit switching given typical Internet traffic patterns, here is an example. Let us assume that every end system on the network sends data at a rate of 100 kilobits per second when it is active. However, each end system is active only for 10% of the time. The end systems also all share a common bottleneck link with a capacity of 1 megabit per second. Given a circuit switch network, every end system would need to reserve 100 kilobits per second and given the bottleneck link's capacity, there can only be 10 end systems in total. In packet switch networks, bandwidth is allocated on demand and the question becomes, what is the probability of more than 10 end systems being active at the same time, given a certain number of end systems? If there are 35 end systems on the network, the probability of more than 10 of them being active at the same time is a mere 0.0004, which is really low. So 3.5 times the amount of end systems compared to a circuit switch network. The problem is that while the probability is low for more than 10 end systems to be active at the same time, it is not zero. So in all fairness, what can happen is that the network could experience congestion, a form of overload, which is not the case in a circuit switch network. How congestion is detected and dealt with on the Internet will be the subject of later videos. One thing that is also worth mentioning in this context is that there are technologies that implement circuit-like behavior over packet switch networks. How these work is however beyond the scope of this video series. Finally, 
let's look at how the networks that make up the Internet are interconnected. What follows now is not based on a set of strict scientific principles, but only a rough illustration. Reality is, as so often, much more complicated, but the structure of the Internet fits this general model more often than not. The networks of the Internet are somewhat hierarchically connected to each other. At the top of that hierarchy, there are so-called Tier 1 providers. Tier 1 providers are a few large Internet service providers that have a global footprint. That means, at many places around the globe, other ISPs can connect to those Tier 1 providers. In order to carry huge volumes of traffic in their global network, they operate high-performance networks including things like undersea cables. These providers can offer smaller ones global reachability. Tier 1 providers interconnect amongst each others at many places around the globe too. They enter into what is called settlement-free peering, which means they exchange traffic without charging the other party for it. Another characteristic of Tier 1 providers is that they have a huge amount of neighbors, which means thousands of other networks that directly connect to these Tier 1 providers. Being a Tier 1 provider, by the way, is not an official status, but given a provider's reach, connectivity and role in the network makes it one. There are other large ISPs on the Internet, but they have no global footprint. Such ISPs could be your national provider or even transnational providers that cover multiple countries or regions. Those are called Tier 2 providers. These Tier 2 providers are typically connected in many locations with different Tier 1 providers. This is called multi-homing. Also, on this hierarchy level, providers enter into settlement-free peerings. The reason for providers to do this is to save operational costs. Both ISPs have cost savings this way because the alternative would be to exchange traffic with each other over Tier 1 providers, which both would have to pay. But generally, smaller providers are customers of larger providers, paying them money for their service. Following the Tier 2 hierarchy level, one could define a few more tiers, but Tier 3 is basically the lowest we would consider. This tier contains regional ISPs. They are often connected both to Tier 2 and Tier 1 providers. Peering amongst Tier 3 providers is less common compared to the higher tiers because of their restricted regional reach. A very different player that still plays an important role for the interconnection of networks on the Internet are so-called Internet Exchange Points, or IXPs for short. IXPs are places and organizations where Internet service providers can connect amongst each other. The IXP offers the platform for this. On today's Internet, IXPs are important connection points where often huge amounts of traffic volume is being exchanged between ISPs. The largest IXP, the DKIX, is in Frankfurt, Germany, which moves about 10 terabits per second during peak times. Last but not least, the large content providers, such as Google, have become important players for the Internet infrastructure. Google is not only a collection of hyperscale data centers that are scattered across the globe, but Google owns a large, though private, network. They like to connect to networks at the lower tiers of the Internet, to networks that host actual end consumers, so that they can deliver their data to them more predictively with less delay. Smaller ISPs gain too, because they get the Google traffic directly from them and do not have to pay a Tier 1 provider for it. Of course, even Google cannot run their own services without the larger Tier 1 ISPs, because they do not have a global footprint themselves or ISPs might be unwilling to connect to the Google network directly. But generally speaking, the networks of these large content providers are characterized by a huge number of other networks that connect to them. In summary, there are two principal ways to build a network, with resource reservations or without. Circuit switch networks, which are networks that employ resource reservation, are a good choice when the demand is known, relatively constant, and or there are very strict requirements on the quality of service. 
the big advantage of these networks is that they indeed can guarantee service quality due to resources being held exclusively for a connection. The disadvantage on the other end is that in case the resources are not being utilized, they are effectively wasted. Packet switch networks, on the other hand, work much better when demand is varying compared to circuit switch networks. Due to the statistical multiplexing effect, resources are better utilized in such situations. The downside is that the service quality cannot be ensured and the network can become congested. The Internet is the prime example of a packet switch network. The networks that form the Internet roughly form a hierarchical structure. The relationship between Internet service providers is based primarily on commercial contracts where one end is the customer and the other end the provider, where the smaller ISP is typically the customer paying for used bandwidth and global reachability. Another relationship that exists are settlement-free peerings, which usually provide mutual benefit to both involved ISPs. All of this leads to paths through the Internet that are not necessarily the best ones from a technical perspective, but simply the cheapest ones because the interconnections between providers are based on economical considerations.